you would this morning, turn back in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> we begin reading this morning with verse 11. We read down through verse 14. <clears throat> And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never wait take away sins. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies were made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So again, we come... <clears throat> Back to chapter 10, and here we find the writer of Hebrews who is reminding these Hebrew believers of the difference and the inferiority of the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And we've spoken of this previously, that the Levitical priest had to continue to perform services to offer sacrifices daily, not just on the Day of Atonement. I think this is important to remember. We've spoken many times, in particular, of the Day of Atonement. But there was a daily ministry of the priest. There were daily sacrifices that had to be administered. In Exodus chapter 29, and there are verses 36 to 39, uh, Moses writes there, you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. And this is, of course, Moses writing this. Of course, the Lord speaking this. You shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and sanctify it. And the altar shall be most holy. Whoever touches the altar must be holy. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar, the two lambs of the first year. Day by day, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. So very accurately here, the writer of Hebrews is saying that this is a continual and repeated offering of sacrifices. And this continual and uh, daily offering of sacrifices was a reminder of Israel's sinfulness. And their separation from God, the need for atonement, the need for sacrifice. There was no finality to these sacrifices. Uh, and he adds that can never take away sins. As I've said before, and I repeat again, as, as the, I think the, the writer of Hebrews is repeating to them, this can never take away sins. The blood of lambs, the blood of bulls, the blood of goats. None of these sacrifices were ever designed to take away sin with finality. They were a type. They were something that pictured uh, Christ, I believe. That spoke of Christ. That spoke of the necessity of the fact of man's sinfulness and the necessity of something having to be done to deal with man's sinfulness. That is the same in this day and time. Man has a sin issue. Man has a sin problem. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He who believes is not condemned. And he that believes not what is condemned already. And there is only one sacrifice that is sufficient to deal with sin. With your sin problem. With my sin problem. And that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. These were never intended to point to the one who would take away sins. As in John 1 and 29 says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's only one Lamb. There's only one sacrifice that has already occurred that would take away the sin of the world, that will take away your sin, that will take away my sin. And that is the Lamb, that's the Lamb of God. And this is really what the, the Hebrew writer is trying, I believe, to convey here to these Hebrew Believers, as I've said, perhaps there were unbelieving Hebrews there that were listening to this. To say to them, look to the Lamb. 
not to the little lambs that have been sacrificed for all of these hundreds of years, but look to the Lamb of God. Then in verse 12, he says, but this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down for I and the John. Now, who is this man he's speaking of? Well, this man is Christ. He's the God man. He's the one come in incarnate flesh. The one who was prophesied uh, throughout the Old Testament as the one, as we just said, who would take away the sins of the world. The one who was the fulfillment of all the types. This man, as he says here, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I think he uses this deliberately to these, this man. He reminds the readers Christ came down. He didn't come down as just some spirit. He didn't come down just as appearance. He did not come down as an angel. But he came as a real flesh and blood man. Amen. He truly was in the flesh. We call that, there's a big term called the hypostatic union. It means that he was God, but he was also flesh. He was also man, joined together there. But he came, he came flesh. I thought of this as we, as we, you know, we've sing these songs at Christmas, and, and what about the song that speaks of veil in flesh, the Godhead see. Veiled the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell. Jesus our Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. He was God with us. God in the flesh. Amen. The Lamb of God come to take away again the sins of the world. And the scriptures over and over prove this point that he came in the flesh. Think about John 1 and 14. John says, the Word, of course the Word there typifying Christ, became what? Flesh. And dwelled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John is saying there, the word of Jesus Christ came and dwelt among us, and I saw him. I beheld him. If you go to 1 John chapter 1, he says, whom our hands basically have handled. I've touched him. I've heard him speak. I've seen him eat. You see, he came in the flesh, and this is the man that is spoken of here. If he had not become a man, he couldn't have become our sacrifice. He had to become a man. Right. Amen. Again, I, I state the importance of us not losing sight of that at this time of year. It's a great time for us to say to those who want to think about the baby Jesus, well, yeah, he was, he was a baby. The reason he was a baby is because he had become a man, because he had become the sacrifice for sinners. That's the important thing. Don't lose sight of that. That's the big picture. That's the main point. That's the reason that he came was to die upon the cross of Calvary. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8 says, He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming what? In the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so of our afternoon theological discussions we talked about it. Words matter. And I'm sure I made this mistake and said that Jesus was fully man. Well, he wasn't fully man like you and I. Was, to be a fully man, that means he's got a sin nature. He was truly a man in that he was of the flesh, but he wasn't fully a man like you and me and had a sin nature. He, but he was truly man. He was fashioned, as he said here, he said, found in appearance as a man. <coughs> His temptations were real. His sufferings were real because he was a man. He was a man. He really did suffer upon that cross. When he said, I thirst, guess what? He thirsted. When he was there in the desert for those 40 days and Satan came and tempted him with hunger, guess what? He really was hungry. It wasn't that he just pretended to be, but he really was. Came in appearances of man. You look at Romans chapter 1, 
There in verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed, or we could say of the line of David, according to the flesh. He, had, he was, he was a, the lawful heir to the throne of Israel. He was of the line of David. He came in the flesh, is what Paul said. And then, as we have studied some time ago, back in chapter 2 of Hebrews, in verse 14 and verse 17, said there, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same what? Flesh and blood. He was a flesh and blood man. He had blood. He bled, just like you and I would believe if we were cut. Why? That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. He came in the flesh. He came as a man that he might destroy sin and death and the devil. And in verse 17, Amen. it says there in that same passage there, therefore in all things he had to be made like his brother. He had to be. It was absolutely necessary that he might also not only be the sacrifice, but that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. We see that there. He came down in flesh, born of the light of David, to sacrifice himself for sin and for sinners and to be a faithful high priest in heaven before the Father. You think about that. The reason that he can be a faithful high priest is because he became a man. He, he was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. He can be a faithful high priest to me in my temptations, in my trials, and all of those things because he came as a man and he, he experienced all of those things. Then we go on a little farther in this same verse. And he says here, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. What a great phrase that is. That's a great phrase. He offered one sacrifice for sins, what? Forever. Forever, not potentially forever, but forever. <clears throat> we, this speaks of the finality. It speaks of the completeness of Christ's sacrifice. Amen. We're reminded by this phrase here of the prophecies of the Old Testament of Christ coming as, as the sacrifice for sinners. Even there in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15, where God said to Satan, guess what? You bruised, you're going to bruise uh, his heel, but he, he's, going to, he's going to crush your head, the seed of the woman, speaking of Christ. In Genesis 22 and 8, if you remember, which is a picture, Abraham went up to offer Isaac upon the mountain as a sacrifice, his only begotten son, if you'll think about that. And that was a miraculous birth, too. If you want to talk about miraculous birth, it's not just about Mary, but it was a miraculous birth, Sarah being 90 years old. His only son. But then Jesus, God said, God said, offer him, offer him. On that mountain, I want you to offer him on that mountain. And they started up on that mountain. And it was just Abraham and Isaac. Isaac got to looking around. He noticed something was missing. What was missing? The sacrifice was missing. Well, what about the sacrifice? He said, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. That spoke prophetically of God the Father providing his son as a sacrifice. And of course, we could read of Psalm 22 and all the great prophecy there that speaks of Christ, that messianic psalm, where he speaks there, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's speaking there of Christ. Him coming in the flesh to sacrifice himself for sinners, for his people. Amen. Isaiah 53 of course, all of that that speaks that if, if, he, if the Father was pleased to bruise him, he has offered him as a sacrifice for sins. He has looked on the travail of his soul and been satisfied. And I thought of that passage, you remember, in Acts chapter 8. When the Ethiopian eunuch was reading that passage of Scripture, he was reading in Isaiah 53. He's out there by himself. God sent him a preacher, he sent him Philip out there. He was reading in Isaiah 53, he was reading there. He says, you know, 
as a lamb. He was offered, but he, uh, he basically, he, he was laying down his life. He was offering no resistance there. And, and, and the eunuch said, Who, what, who's this speaking of? Uh, is the author speaking of himself or somebody else? What does the scripture there say that Philip got up there and preached to Jesus? Because Isaiah 53 speaks of Jesus. You see, so this offering of one sacrifice for sins forever speaks of Christ. And so he is the fulfillment of all of these prophecies uh, in his first advent. And this is, I mean, people, some people call this the advent season. And there's nothing wrong with that, calling it the advent season. It, 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 we remember the first advent, the first coming of Christ in the flesh. Now the big advent will be the second advent. Which will bring everything to a close, the second advent of Christ. When he will come again and return for his people. When I thought about that, this time of year, so many people are, all they're worried about is what they're going to get yeah. at Christmas time. They don't think about Jesus except on the periphery. But let me tell you this, let me say this, that he, God the Father, is the giver of the greatest gift. And that is forgiveness and eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. There is no greater gift than that. And that's what we have through this man who, as it says here, offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Just think about that. One sacrifice for sins forever. Eternally, eternal life. Again, I thought about John 1 and 29, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Think about John chapter 10, there in verse uh, so many, so much of that is sort of like feel like Brother Chris. So have, where, where, what do you leave out of that? <laughs> you know, or do you just read the whole chapter? But in John chapter ten, verses fifteen through eighteen, there, and as Christ was speaking, there being the shepherd and the sheep, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Guess why he's not going to lose one of them? Not a single one of those sheep for whom he dies and he lays his life down for. They are going, as it says here, he's going to offer his, he to lay down his life, give his life an offering forever. Forever. You have life now as a child of God forever. Rejoice in that. We ought to be rejoicing in that. Yes, the Father, he says, therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Nobody took Jesus' life. Yes, he was murdered, but the only reason that he got in his life ebbed from his body is because he laid it down of his own authority. Yes. I have power, authority to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And you go on down to verses 27 through 30 there. And what did Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. And what I give unto them, eternal life. I give to them forever life. Because I've offered my, I'm going to offer my life up. Amen. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch it out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me. God is going to give them to me, by the way. You notice that? He didn't say he is going to give them to me. He said he's already given them to me. That's important. And in the Father's mind, the Father's determination and the Son's determination, they were already given to the Son, but he is coming along to seal the deal. Amen. To lay down his life, to give himself an offering, to <clears throat> shed his blood, to purchase their salvation, as we read in Hebrews, to obtain their eternal, their forever redemption. And he said, he's given them to me, he's greater than all, and nobody's going to be able to snatch him in my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. They made this pact. And then when he died there upon the cross in John 19 and 30, what did he say? It is finished. To less time. It is finished. It is done. I have purchased it. Their salvation is secure.
secure. Their eternal redemption is secure. Their sonship is secure. All that I have in heaven is theirs because it is finished. I have offered up my life. I have laid down my life. I love what Peter wrote over in 1 Peter chapter 1. There in verse 19. He says, knowing, and we're really beginning with verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but what? But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world that was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Our faith and hope are in God because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again. It's done. It is forever done. Finally, completely. Nothing to be added to that. And the finality and the, I say, the finality and the completeness of his sacrifice is expressed in that one simple word, forever. Forever. How long is forever? It's a self-defining word. <laughs> forever. You can't add anything to forever. It is done forever. And this sacrifice of Christ was no temporary measure now, I know of people that, that believe that you can lose your salvation, that somehow you can be saved and then lost. No, 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 a thousand times, no. And I can say that, why? Let the word of God be true in every man a liar. We believe this because this is what God's Word says. It is forever. It is eternal. It is obtained past tense. It is done. It is ratified. I am justified and in the mind of God glorified. No adding to it. No taking away from it. And then it says, when this was done, what did Christ do? Hmm. It says, after he offered that sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, what is that telling us there? Well, it leaves out something, but he's making the assumption they understand that this means he didn't stay dead. After the sacrifice was offered, he rose from the dead and he went back to the Father. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's why I wanted to have Brother Chris read that Psalm 110 uh, before. We quoted that Psalm. We've talked about that Psalm in here before. But again, he is seated at the right hand. The Lord said to my Lord, Jehovah said to my Adonai, sit here until I make your enemies, your footstool. I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but anyway. But that, that is what it speaks of there. It speaks of this fulfillment of Psalm 110, that after Christ's fulfillment of his sacrifice and then his resurrection, he ascended back to the Father and sat down. Now what we see here, I want you to notice something here. Again, we see the superiority of the new covenant to the Old Covenant, of Christ to the Old Testament priest. The sitting down is in a very stark contrast to the earthly priest. You know something you don't see in the Old Covenant, the Old Priesthood? What do you see? Does it ever talk about them sitting down? Does it ever talk about them resting from their labors? No. It said they stood daily. 
They continued daily to offer sacrifice. There was no ceasing. There was no sitting down. There was no resting. Generation upon generation upon generation, they continued to offer the sacrifice to labor. Now, something else that I thought of here. There was always a separation between the earthly high priest and God. You remember we gave that description that there was the, the holy place in that little enclosure inside the tabernacle, and then there was the most holy place. Now, on a daily basis, they could go in kind of to that holy place. There was only one day a year that the one high priest could go in to that most holy place. And even he, before he went into there, had to sacrifice for himself, to offer sacrifices for himself. And if you remember about the, the incense and the burning of the incense, and they had to create a cloud so that there was a barrier between him and God. But guess what? Christ goes back to the Father, and he goes into the heaven of heavens, he just sits down right next to the Father. Amen. Amen. No sacrifice for his sins. Right. Right. He had right to be in the presence of God, and he is there in the presence of God as our high priest, but it speaks of the completeness again, the finality of that sacrifice, that there is no more sacrifice to be done, to be performed. The work is done. There's no separation. Christ, the Son of God, in glorified flesh. If he rose again. If he was still in that flesh, he's in the Father's presence, I believe, now as the God-man interceding for us as high priest. He is there interceding the new covenant, the covenant of the grace of God. Again, to remind you, a couple of chapters back over of things that we've already spoken of, but I just want to touch upon here in, in chapter 7 and verse 26 of Hebrews. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy. You see, that's why he's able to go into the Father's presence. He is holy harmless, undefiled, separate for sin, from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. There's the first heavens that, that we see around <coughs> us. There's the second heavens that is the, the, the stars and the, and the moon and the galaxies, and then there's the third heaven where he is. Higher than all of the heavens. In chapter 8, in verse 6, it says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also a mediator, one of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. He's there interceding for us, holy, a holy high priest. In verse 11 of chapter 9, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not of this creation, no, not of this creation, but where God the Father is. And in verse 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator what? Of the new covenant, the better covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. He makes certain, he has made certain, he is there as our high priest to make certain that we receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. <coughs> of the eternal inheritance. He is mediating for us. And he's waiting. He's mediating and he's waiting. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Hmm. Brother Chris was speaking this morning on the fear of God. For the children of God, there is a fear. Amen. It is a phileo fear. It is the fear of a father that we love Amen. when we understand that there, he is to be feared as our father. Even more so God than our earthly fathers. 
there's a second kind of fear called a servile fear. And if you're outside of Christ, you better be afraid. Because with this fear, there is judgment. There is judgment. You cannot get away from it in the scriptures that there is judgment. And that's what he's speaking of here from that time. Wait until his enemies are made his footstool. And all of those outside of Christ are counted as his enemies. They are his enemies. And judgment is going to come. And you remember, I was, as I was studying this, I thought of this, the words of the two men were told of in Acts 1 and 11. Most people will say, well, those two angels, but it just says two men. And I'm assuming that they were likely angels. But they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He is going to come again. He is going to come again. But not as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's going to come as king. And when Christ returns, there's going to be, obviously, there's, there's two things that are going to happen. There's going to be glorification. Praise God, there's going to be glorification. The chain of grace. Those who be called, those who he foreknew, he also called, these he called, he also justified, and those he justified, them he also glorified. That's going to happen. He's going to come again to do that for, for all of his people. We shall be changed, as it says, in a moment, in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. This corruptible must put on incorrupt, incorruption, as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says. Paul there in 1 Corinthians 15 just, I think, gets almost carried away in the ecstasy as he's speaking of that. We're going to be raised. 1 John 3 and 2 speaks of that when he comes again, we shall be changed and we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. But let me say this, that those promises are for God's people. His children alone have that hope. But something else is going to happen when he returns. And that's going to be judgment. And all mankind should be afraid of that. They should fear. In fact, in Revelation it says that those that are here when he comes again are going to cry for the rocks and the hills to fall on them and to hide them from the face of he that has come to judge them. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 5 through 10 speaks very, I think, very clearly about the two aspects of the coming again, again of Christ. There, beginning with verse 5, he says, he's speaking here about their, their uh, persecutions and their patience and their faith in all the persecutions and the tribulations that you endure. He said, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer since it is a righteous thing, not an unrighteous thing, but it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who have troubled you and to give you your trouble rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say this. All of those that do not obey the gospel, all of those that have heard the gospel and have not obeyed the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to pour out his judgment. Amen. There's, there's no way to soft shoe that. And it shouldn't be. We should speak that truth plainly. There should be a fear that courses through the hearts and the minds of every unbeliever when they read that scripture. Should be. And that is what he speaks of here when it speaks of he is going, his enemies are going to be his footstool. And this harkens back to during that day and time when a king, when he conquered another king, that they would very often bring that conquered king before him and he would put his foot 
on his head or his neck. This is what he means. He's waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. He's interceding for us. But there will be a day when the intercession will be over. He will come again, and his people will be taken back with him in glorification, but his enemies will be judged. They will be his footstool. When Christ returns in this second advent, that's what's going to happen. And then the final reminder of four, by one offering, he has perfected perfect tense. He has perfected, done in the mind of God forever. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. You see, it is a once for all. It is a one time thing that Christ has done when he gave himself as an offering and that he obtained eternal redemption. And I think of this, I look at this and I think of how unworthy that I was of this sacrifice. But oh, what a joy it is today as a child of God to know that I have been perfected forever. That I have obtained eternal redemption forever. And the work that he is doing in me is an eternal work. I have eternal life now. That, that, that concept is so hard for me, you know, because we're in these mortal bodies, but to understand, to know that I have eternal life now that I have been. I have been declared forever His. We trust in that. We do not trust in our good works, but we trust in the work of Christ upon the cross when He offered Himself a sacrifice for sinners forever. What a glorious, glorious truth and a glorious thing that we see here in these verses of and my plea this morning for those outside of Christ, there's no place else to look for salvation. And there's no better place to look because he has made this one offering that God the Father is satisfied with. Look to him. Call upon him. Think upon your son and know that without him, you will be one of those under judgment. Right. You will be counted as an enemy of Christ. Call upon him while he may be found. Amen. May we pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, how we rejoice in the offering of Christ one time Purchasing our salvation forever. Fulfilling your requirement. Knowing that a payment for sin had to be made. It had to be made. Heavenly Father, our hearts as, as your children rejoice in this truth, but also our hearts are weighed down with the thoughts of others that we love and that we know that do not know you. Father, I would pray this day that you would awaken them. You would stir in them. That you would give them life. That you would regenerate them and, and give them this ability to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for that. We pray for that drawing of the Holy Spirit. Even today, for our loved ones, our friends who do not know. You know the